Today's Monday at Beinecke Talk exemplifies that mission of engagement of the past in the present for the future. And it exemplifies the creative ways contemporary Yale students make use of the special collections in Yale Library. We are honored this afternoon to have with us David John Walker, an MFA candidate in graphic design at the Yale School of Art, to talk about his art and how he uses archival collections in his practice. Walker is at once a student, a scholar, a teacher, a civic activist, and a professional practitioner. It is my delight to turn the screen over to you. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, I really appreciate this. Um, hello, Gailies and, and citizens of, of the world. Um, so archives is font. So I'm here to talk about font in the sense of typefaces that make up the languages that we read across devices, letters, and other uh, media. So Lux e Veritas, um, the model of Yale, light and truth is held amongst the collections of many academic and cultural institutions available to those that are of the means and minds to access them. In this narrative, I'll share how I came to use the Beinecke as font or the archives as font. So on the first weekend that Beinecke eased COVID restrictions for non-Yale visitors, I was excited to share this access with my teenage children. I thought I would just show them the space, but what ensued blew our minds. Upon, enter upon entering the Beinecke, we encountered Michael Moran and exchanged pleasantries as he asked my kids if they wanted to see something cool. Of course they said yes. So we ended up descending into the stacks uh, for the reading room. And there, Michael shares with them the personal effects of Langston Hughes, including a wallet, his longtime writing pen, and his personal teaching copy of the Weary Blues. We all left inspired and engaged. That trip, the architecture and the artifacts themselves compelled me to create a font and a typeface based on the library itself. Forms and counterforms are the basis of all letters, and I found the blocks of the Beinecke to be suitable subjects for this creative exercise. So I drew out one block. From that one block became four blocks to create a vertical stem. That vertical stem became the foundation for the rest of the letters and numbers. I named the font stacks because librarians colloquially call the bookshelves stacks. From the counterforms of the blocks, I created stacks light. So using uh, stacks light and stacks bold, I collected a few names of black figures in the Beinecke to create a short anthology to commemorate the visit as a gift to my children, aptly named in the deeps of the stacks. A collection of poems from black figures in the Beinecke uh, featuring Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, and W.E.B. Du Bois. And these are sample pages, some sample spreads from this booklet. A name is worth a thousand words, and names hold history. So as far as I've known, and as long as I've been alive, I've been asked, do you know about David Walker's appeal? Do you know who you're named after? And I said, actually, yes. Uh, my great uncle, uh, David King, not pictured, but my late father, David L. Walker, me, uh, David John Walker, and my son, David Jaron Walker. And from Blacks of a certain generation and educators asked, do you know about David Walker's appeal? David Walker was an abolitionist, a writer and an entrepreneur who actually sold clothing. clothing. He was born to a free mother and an enslaved father. He grew up uh, resenting the treatment levied upon his father whose death preceded his birth and enslaved relatives. Upon coming of age, he vowed to leave the inhumanity of the South behind while championing, championing the freedom of colored citizens. He once said, if I remain in this bloody land, I will not live long. As true God reigns, I will be avenged for the sorrow which my people have suffered. This is not the place for me. No, no, no. 
I must leave this part of the country. Go, I must. My first personal encounter with the original document was under glass at the exhibition at the Schomburg Center in Harlem, Subversion and the Art of, uh, Art of Slavery Abolition. During my um, visit with the children, I asked Michael if there was a copy in possession at the Beinecke, and he happened to have it on his desk. It was in the collection of the slavery pamphlets of Reverend Amos Beeman, a prominent New Haven minister of the 1800s. The Appeal to Colored Citizens of the World was an 87 page document to denounce slavery and implore colored citizens of the world to rise up from their lots and claim freedom and rights. David Walker, a learned man, was masterful in the typographic effects of using italics and special characters for em emphasis. As a journalist, he wrote for the first black newspaper in the country, Freedom's Journal, founded in New York in 1827. In 1817, the Boston Type Foundry was founded, uh, selling typefaces for printing publications. So um, looking at Brevier number four, and this specimen was found in the Library of Congress, I set out to revive this typeface for contemporary uses. So this is a sample of Brevier number four and a sample page of the appeal. Um, and they both feature a high contrast serif typeface. So for those that don't know, a serif is a decorative terminal ending at the end of letters. A sans serif, like a Helvetica or Verdana, is without, decorate, without decorative terminal endings on the letters. So in looking at these things, I had to fish out and extrapolate the lowercase and uppercase letters. So using these fuzzy scans, <laughs> I had to dissect the anatomy of each letter to understand and the familial characteristics of the typeface, looking at the serifs, looking at the open counters, which are the, the spaces left open, bilateral serifs, the stems um, of the typeface, which make the letters consistent, um, looking at the descenders and how far they go, as well as the uh, contrasting connecting elements. So this is a drawing, a digital drawing of a lowercase uh, letter and looking at how these things connect and form um, the typeface. So skele skeletally, I'm looking at rounded X height terminals and looking at dimpled baseline terminals. So in my finished end, it's not as um, egregious or as evident. So based on that time, it was necessary at smaller at smaller uh, weights and smaller printing sizes that the exaggeration of this uh, baseline or the dimple in this baseline to be greater so that printing at smaller sizes, it was still legible. Here's a uppercase uh, digital drawing of a Q and you can see the points, you can see the width of the stem, <clears throat> the shoulder of the O, or the Q, um, the counter form and the forms themselves and the crispness of the line that is created to create the Q. So I named the typeface appeal and this is it in its glory. This is the uppercase uh, letter forms A through Z uh, created with the passion and heritage uh, that David Walker chose um, to publish his appeal. And this is the lower case. And you have teardrop terminals on the A, uh, C, F, G, R. As well as the numerals. And special characters. And this is all of them together, uppercase, lowercase, and numerals. Because the, the pamphlets themselves were printed at a small size for portability at the time um, in 1829 and republished in 1830, um, it was the original published document was like 
four by six or four by seven and a half. So the average type size was seven point. So this is a, a look at the typeface printed at a smaller size. Oh my, colored brethren all over the world, when shall we arise from this death-like apathy and be men? The truth of the matter is all typefaces hold meaning and they derive from something. Of all of the typefaces at the time that uh, David Walker could have chosen um, for his, his pamphlet, he chose a brevier or something close to it um, to create this moving work. Thank you. Thank you. That was brilliant. And uh, we'll have time for questions. I would note one of the uh, comments that we have uh, to, to David and myself is, uh, wow, what a gorgeous font with multiple exclamation points, which I agree. Um, the peel <laughs> font is so beautiful. Uh, people want to know where can they get it. Uh, but but let me go back to the beginning. And I, I told you that I was going to ask this question. but. Uh, most most uh, uh, three year olds or twelve year olds maybe want to go to the moon, be a firefighter, uh, poet, or something. Not a lot of people necessarily say I want to be a graphic designer or make uh, typefaces. So so what was it that got you? That being said, typography is essential, as, as I think you you uplifted. We all live with it, uh, so its importance is there, but it's not something people necessarily is kids think about uh, for, for a career. What is it that led you into graphic design generally and being interested in typography uh, particularly? Well, I got my start. Uh, my dad is a, a former professor. My late father, father was a former professor in music. And so growing up in the arts, we were always exposed to the culture of performing arts and visual arts. And in high school, I was like deeply embedded into sciences and things of that nature, but always uh, gravitated towards uh, the visual arts. So once I got to undergrad and, and found my way into a studio arts practice um, and major, I decided that graphic design to my parents would be the most meaningful thing that they really could wrap their heads around. <laughs> um, being a studio artist in in the in the way that is colloquially colloquially known is um, arts is like a starving artist kind of thing, and in the culture, you know, um, medicine, law, um, and other familiar um, jobs and occupations uh, were things that originally I was thinking of, but once I got to school, I thought, well, maybe I can dive into something else that uh, to me felt a little more personal, felt a little more fun um, and that I could see myself and kind of make a career of. So I ended up diving into web design, which is the manipulation of type, um, type and images, you know, through the digital format. And it wasn't until later in my career, which is actually how I ended up at Yale after explorations of hand lettering that I really figured out um, that the way we communicate and having a mastery, you know, of letter forms is kind of the pinnacle, right? We can always mix um, type and words. Like right now, meme culture is like the most visible uh, combination of, of letters and, and images. Um, but mastering letter forms to think about the nuances of how letters emote or how the combinations of letters can emote drove this passion to try and um, figure out and investigate how best I could use type and letter forms to better communicate design work. Thank you for that. And uh, I mean, I think it sort of underscores everybody's into typography. They may not know it. <laughs> they, may not, they may not state it uh, as such, but I think what you just said about meme culture sort of underscores that. Um, a beautiful line that all typefaces hold meaning and wanted to go back to, to one of the sources, Walker's Appeal, and just talk, take some time to talk a little bit more about that document and, and if, if we know anything about who his collaborators were and 
talk a little bit about its circulation and what, what you've come to know about it, uh, for, particularly for those in the audience who may know top line that it exists, but don't know a whole lot about it as a document and impact that it had in, in its own sort of book history. So Warpath's appeal um, to the colored citizens of America was this document written specifically to talk to um, enslaved Americans or colored citizens in the world. And at the time, um, and he writes in this narrative that slaves in America outnumber uh, their captors like 3 million to 7, 70,000 or something like that. And that, they're, that they actually have the power to take up arms and free themselves from, from bondage and tyranny. And so he, he, he also talks about America being um, a land of all people and not just the captors or the folks that are looking to be, to find freedom. Um, and so he writes, he writes as a protagonist to both sides. And while it's charged, <laughs> he also is like pleading that there will be no danger if, if at the time the captors and enslavers would just release um, the slaves to peacefully exist and, or peacefully coexist uh, so that, that there would be equality and freedom in the United States. The thing that I really found interesting is that he found his life's mission and calling um, becoming a journalist, like fleeing the South when he came of age, finding employment as a merchant um, in clothing, and then a journalist as well to, to become an abolitionist. And even though he's not credited for being a founder of Freedom's Journal, um, the two founders that are credited, uh, Russ, I think it's Russ Werman or something, I, I forget his name. Um, they met in his living room in Boston uh, to, to come up with the name of this paper and to actually create the paper in itself. And so he and another gentleman were responsible for, for getting articles, um, from the New England area to distribute and disseminate throughout the North and South uh, for freedmen and slave men alike to know what was happening in the abolitionist movement. And so he knew, he, he absolutely knew that putting out a work, a work as charged as this um, would mean that his life would be in danger. And he was encouraged to flee to Canada uh, to seek refuge and safety, and he refused. Um, and so, in 1830, the year after this was published, he was actually poisoned, um, and and as it says, he died a, a peaceful um, a peaceful death, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but he was, I want to say, 31 uh, years old, and he actually died before his son was born, and his son was actually the first elected Black American official um, in Massachusetts Massachusetts um, Congress. Looking at the document, you pointed out to me, I had not, you know, I, I knew it, but really clearly was not paying close enough attention. The use of quotation marks uh, stood out. You pointed it out to me. I wonder if you could talk about that and paint a word picture and, and, and what that means and what that does and, and how the way it is set helps uh, underline meaning in the, in the text itself. So it's pretty cool to see him adeptly use um, italics and special characters and quotations for emphasis, knowing that the folks that could read were typically um, either graduates of some level of institution. And if they were in the, in the South, they were um, taught to read, uh, but they were, they were preachers and, and ministers and, and folks of standing. And thinking about the fact that he knew that this would be read to others. And with this being read to others, he wrote it as if it would be read to others. So when you see italics, that that could mean, you know, speak a little bit louder. Or um, when you see exclamation marks, you know, <laughs> say it with force. So when you think about our use of um, accessibility um, in HTML for like websites, if you put like em as as a tag on a word for emphasis the screen reader will actually read it a little bit louder. 
or if it's not reading it, it will be in bold. Um, or if you put an I tag around something in HTML code, it will italicize it so that it that it is special and gives it um, additional meaning. Thank you, and thank you both for the, the answer about uh, Walker's appeal and also that very helpful uh, comparison to our contemporary 20, 21st century uh, web readers. Many questions from the audience. Uh, I'll, I'll read uh, one. Uh, do you have suggestions for mixing fonts? I see behind you there is a cursive and bold font. So what, what's <laughs> oh, your, what's your the, yeah. practice of mixing <laughs> fonts? Um. I actually like the mixed fonts just to speak to the nuance of voice. Um, and so sometimes if I want something to stand out from another, I will use uh, two to three voice, uh, two to three emotive voices within typefaces. So this is actually a hand lettered piece uh, based on a Mae Jemison quote. Uh, this is the future, uh, let me see. The future never uh, just happened. <laughs> um, and as a scientist herself and an astronaut thinking about things being planned. And so with that being said, like this document and it preceding a lot of different um, historical events, you know, we were just speaking about like Nat Turner's rebellion and, and the possibility of, of him having, having this document. Like it, it came out two years before his rebellion in the Carolinas, uh, which led to a whole host of things including uh, stricter um, laws against like blacks reading or, or blacks having um, literary articles that speak to uh, self-empowerment or freedom. Thank you. A um, number of people have asked questions. I'll, I'll quote one, that, but a number of people have a similar or variations. What futures do you imagine for stacks and for appeal? Oh, <laughs> um, I don't know yet. I've never published a typeface. I've I've got a, a good a great host of friends that are type designers that have published uh, typefaces, but at at some point I will release these uh, both of these typefaces for you. Terrific. Uh, we have a, a willing uh, audience uh, for for each and for both. Uh, a question, which is one that I was thinking about as you were going through, when using archives as a basis for typefaces, how do you design special characters that may appear so that they feel in keeping with the rest of the typeface? Well, in looking at the nuances of the characters, uh, you you definitely want to match up the intensity or the emotive qualities that they that they all hold, and then looking at the the skeletal features, you want to. Um, keep the consistency uh, throughout. And it's just the iterative process of drawing these characters over and over um, so that it looks like a family. It's kind of difficult, like in the, in the um, example for Walker's appeal and having to go through the entire document to find all of the letters. Like I didn't find a Z. So I had to find, I had to look at uh, Brevier as a skeleton, but, um, alter it in such a way that my Z looked like it was a part of the font family uh, created for appeal. And same for the for the characters. Uh, we have a guest who uh, wonders, has the internet destroyed creativity and typography? Uh, what's your sense of what uh, the internet's impact on typography has been? I actually don't, I think, the internet has opened up uh, the discourse uh, for you to find more options for creativity or at least um, font usage. Um, there are a lot of, you have like defont.com, which is a free platform. I don't necessarily subscribe to that, uh, but people, if they wanna publish a font, they can create fonts and, and load them for free uh, to that platform. You have myfonts.com, um, which are paid, font platforms. Um, but the thing that the internet allows you to see is fonts that are created in different cultures as well, whether that's uh, Devin Gari script or whether that's um, Asian uh, scripts or African um, symbols, you can see how these characters um, are in use. Like currently there is a, uh, a Native American um, 
typographic conference that's coming up, I think in New York uh, at the end of this week. And so with that being said, without the internet, without Zoom, without uh, these contemporary uh, platforms, we wouldn't all have that opportunity to see how these different uh, languages and letter forms uh, would be constructed and used in, in our contemporary culture. Thank you. A um, couple more comments and, and, a, and a question. Uh, viewer says an incredible origin story from this font, so powerful. Uh, also, if you continue to get things, that, uh, please let us know when appeals will be available. Uh, so, uh, uh, a question uh, that comes from a colleague on campus noting uh, beautiful work and interesting contrast between the two typefaces and the uh, our, our uh, colleague asks about your process. Do you incorporate drawing or other analog mark making when you begin or refine letter forms? Absolutely. Um, it really depends on what the inspiration is. If I see something right in the street um, or on the street that looks like it could be the basis of the foundation of a typeface, I will sketch it out first before taking it to the computer. I created a typeface, um, I guess earlier this year, based on the topography of New Haven. So it's called uh, Topography Standard. And so it, it it's this geometric, almost puzzle-like uh, typeface that's created from what looks like a, a topographical map. Um, and zoom the way it creates, or you, at least you can decipher the letters, but the closer you get, they almost deconstruct and just look like circles and, and ovals and other amorphous shapes. So yeah, I mean, inspiration can kind of come from anywhere. I've got a friend, um, Trey Seals, who just created a typeface called Jimmy, and it's based on a guitar pick. <laughs> so it's pretty cool to see you know, where um, where typefaces can, or how they can be inspired. He also created a, a typeface, typeface called Spike, which is based on um, Radio Rahim's, um, I think it was a three finger ring uh, from Do the Right Thing. So it's pretty cool to, again, see how typefaces can- Talk a little bit more around. about the, the New Haven type. Um, let me see. I actually, I'm going to see if I can pull up a picture for you all uh, before we get off of here uh, so I can show you this one because it's hard to explain. I, I love that. I mean, it, Yale is a place where types take it seriously. And I think New Haven is too, right? When, when one goes to and from the train station, uh, that there's that electric transformer area where the, the uh, typeface for the uh, New Haven Railroad is shown and it's sort of iconic, so. Let's see, I think I can show this one. Let's see, zoom, share. As you're doing that, there we go. All right, can you see it? Yeah. So talk us through a little bit about inspiration and process and, uh, on this one. Yeah, so this one, I, I actually found a, um, a topographical map of New Haven from like 1954 um, and took the elevations um, from that map and drew out a few of those and then constructed them in a way that the typeface uh, would be decipherable. Um, outside of that, I think it would be indecipherable, but in a line, they're uh, surprisingly legible. Yeah, it, it uh, on first glance, I, I like how it's quite humane. <laughs> I, I get I get a, a, a sort of human sense to it uh, in a sort of immediate way, even though it's you know using you said topographical. But that's mine. Um, yeah, I think about uh, talk about your sense of Yale as a place to do type and what it means that not a lot of institutions have their own typeface and, and what it means uh, that we have our own the Yale typeface. No, I mean, it's a special thing. I mean, you've got uh, one of the one of the um, factors that drew me to the program 
was the fact that Tobias Ferrer Jones and Nina Stosinger, uh, both are professors here um, in type design. And Tobias Ferrer Jones is known for uh, drawing the typeface Gotham, which is the font that Barack Obama ran on. And he's also, uh, he and um, Nina collaborated on this typeface called Empirica which is the current word mark for the National Gallery of Art. And a derivative of that is also used um, for Carnegie Hall. And then in addition to that, um, we, we have a, a, a frequent um, visiting critic, um, Matthew Carter, who's kind of known as like the godfather of type. Um, I think, did Matthew Carter have something to do with the Yale typeface? Yeah, he made it. Oh, yeah, I want to say he did make it, um, but he's got like 15 or 20 uh, typefaces licensed to Microsoft Office, which when I found that out was just absolutely mind blowing, like Georgia and Verdana and, and others um, that we all use in their kind of household names um, in our use of in our use of type and, and, and font. I've put in the chat uh, a link for next week's Mondays with Beinecke, which is uh, in uh, connection with the Quasquai Bicentennial of the Grove Street Cemetery, which uh, means the 225th anniversary <laughs> of the cemetery. Uh, and there will be a, a little bit of talk about the history of the cemetery, but also uplifting and centering the stories of Bias and Margaret Stanley, important 19th century figures in New Haven uh, and centurions of the Dixwell Avenue Congregational United Church of Christ, among other uh, community institutions. So I hope everybody can join us for that. Um, what other sources are you looking at now in your work, whether they're contemporary or archival? Um, they're both. I mean, it's interesting that you just mentioned the cemetery, like to look at old fonts and old typefaces. Um, going through cemeteries and looking at, at headstones, you can kind of see and extrapolate from them um, fonts that are like one of one <laughs> that a stone carver or stone letterer would have made iterations to letters that normally would, would have not been um, decorative ends like flourishes or, or additional serifs um, that are just absolutely gorgeous and beautiful that I can you know, leverage uh, for contemporary use in letters that I may create. It's fantastic. Um, I want to close with an open prompt to you. Uh, and and uh, again, uh, I, I love the line, all typefaces hold meaning. And I wonder if you might uh, pick a face and some work where you encountered it that well embodies the truth that all typefaces have meaning and uh, and uh, send us out with a, a, a type and a text that came together that really hold great meaning for you. That's really difficult. <laughs> because the reason I say that is because um, type itself is a very Eurocentric medium of communication, right? And so when you think about how you encounter it and when you encounter it and why you encounter it things that come to mind are like the subway system in new york how it's approachable the typeface that is used is approachable but also um, authoritative and that same um system or train of thought and thinking would also be found in like the london underground and their their subway system and tube system there so each and every time we pick up a device or we look at something that's printed it's directing our attentions in a, in a way that is spoken inherently um or unspoken that triggers you know subconscious meanings and things of that nature so yeah i don't necessarily know of of a typeface that kind of does that i i do um think back to gotham right that that um that obama ran on and thinking about the that word hope and how Shepard Ferry used it um, on his poster, on his poster rendition of Obama's face. And, and the fact that anytime you saw it, it was a ubiquitous uh, message of unity. And it wasn't, um, 
ostentatious and it wasn't um, over the top. It was it was a typeface meant for everybody to to connect with and connect to. And so the what while it had you know of course it's a sans serif and has um, some hard edges. The very uh, geometric O's and circular um, parts of that typeface made it very approachable and friendly. Thank you for that. I'll uh, end by uh, another quote uh, from uh, an audience member who said of uh, David John Walker's appeal, inspired by David Walker's appeal, uh, something that I think is a, a good uh, uh, commendation for any typeface, so beautifully readable, exclamation point. Thank you for joining us virtually to share this work in prog progress and how the archives have been a uh, font for your work. Thank you all for joining us today. And as I said to David, uh, before we began, when I saw the registration numbers and we had more than 100 people join us, it says something about our campus and, and our community and, and the audience uh, around the world for Beinecke that we have 100 plus people joining together to think about typography on a Monday afternoon. It makes me very happy. Thank you all for joining us and David, most especially. Thank you for leading us this afternoon. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me.